Good afternoon and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Clinical Applications of Ultrasonic Enhancing Agents in Echocardiography. My name is Kelly Baer and I am the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the Questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar, as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left side of your screen is the Resources tab. Click this tab for a link to today's handouts, which include a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select each file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, Please note the Request Support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the Notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the ASE CEU credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinars portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenters. With us today are Dr. Thomas Porter and Margaret M. Park. Dr. Porter is Professor of Medicine at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska, where he is also the Theodore F. Hubbard Distinguished Chair of Cardiology. Margaret M. Park, known to many as COCO, is the HVI Lead Imaging Specialist at the Cleveland Clinic Imaging Core Lab C5 Research. She is also the 2017 ASE Sonographer Lifetime Achievement Award recipient. Both are true experts in the field of ultrasound, and we thank them for being with us today. And with that, I will now turn this webinar over to our first presenter, Dr. Thomas Porter. Doctor? Thank you very much, Kelly, and it's an honor to be able to give this webinar. And I think the most important thing is get moving here so that um, we can take uh, a lot of questions at the end. The objectives of this talk will be uh, to go over the clinical applications of ultrasound enhancing agents, uh, which is what we now uh, try to refer to uh, these agents as to our patients and to referring physicians, and to go over this very important, very low mechanical index imaging concept that was uh, emphasized in the guidelines, uh, and then uh, to discuss myocardial perfusion imaging applications and new uh, uh, evolving clinical applications that will uh, definitely dominate future guide guidelines. As you are aware, uh, the FDA in the United States has approved three uh, enhancing agents or the one indication of left ventricular pacification. Uh, this includes Lumison, uh, Dafinity, and Optison. They share the common uh, theme of being a high molecular weight gas encapsulated in either a phospholipid or human albumin shell. Imaging these agents is very critical, and the Guidelines Committee felt this was uh, very important to emphasize uh, and try to get industry engaged in making this a little bit easier for sonographers and physicians to utilize uh, these imaging concepts. Uh, we, we have referred to Amplitude modulation or power modulation is a very low mechanical index imaging technique because we use a less than 0.18 mechanical index for these imaging techniques, and I'll explain to you why in just a moment. The second option you have is the low mechanical index harmonic imaging modalities, which is just basically turning your harmonic tissue harmonic imaging mechanical index down to around 0.3 or less. There are big differences between these two types of imaging modalities, and we want to spend a little bit, a few minutes talking about them. The reason that is is because these imaging modalities uh, form the basis by which we can really enhance left ventricular opacification with 
uh, an infusion or bolus injection of the ultrasound enhancing agent. And that is the one FDA approved indication that we're not doing well yet. Okay. We still uh, have not optimized this uh, technique, uh, and we're grossly underutilizing enhancing agents uh, in the United States uh, to if, improve regional wall motion and ejection fraction assessments, as Margaret Park will uh, uh, go into in just a few moments. But in addition to that, we can also look at myocardial perfusion uh, with a very low mechanical index imaging technique. And with both harmonic, low MI harmonic, and uh, the uh, very low MI imaging techniques, we can enhance Doppler signals, all of which are very important, uh, and we will go into these today. Now, as I said, you have two choices when using a ultrasound enhancing agents uh, to enhance left ventricular pacification, the FDA-approved indication for uh, ultrasound enhancing agents. You have the low mechanical index imaging modality, which is harmonic imaging, and then you have the very low mechanical index imaging, what the guidelines refer uh, to as very low mechanical index imaging, which is less than 0.2 mechanical index, but is a fundamental uh, nonlinear imaging pro uh, uh, approach uh, that has several distinct advantages. The low mechanical index imaging approach, which is harmonic imaging, uh, reduces microbubble uh, destruction uh, and, and produces some enhancement of the microbubble contrast but receives only at the harmonic frequency. And the best way for me to show you how that works uh, is just to go right to a patient, okay? This is a patient uh, in, uh, that we did in the intensive care unit um, uh, uh, on an afternoon uh, reading day. And you can see on the left, uh, the four chamber view was obtained. And you can see that there is a right ventricle and a left ventricle. Uh, and atria, but if you were to ask to tell what the ejection fraction was, which is what we were asked to do, uh, and assess regional wall motion, you would say that's uh, not possible with this technique. Now, the patient's intubated. Uh, they're not going to be able to come down for an MRI real quickly, uh, and it's going to be a real hassle doing anything like that. So what do we do? Well, this is where we use the ultrasound enhancing agent. And typically, when you think about using the ultrasound enhancing agent, you use this low mechanical index harmonic approach. You just turn the mechanical index down on your tissue harmonic imaging, high mechanical index tissue harmonic imaging that you're using without contrast, and then use the uh, uh, 0.3 mechanical index or less uh, modality with harmonic imaging. So you're transmitting here at 1.6 uh, megahertz. And as you can see here, although it's very, very tiny on the screen, you're receiving at 3.2 megahertz. So yes, you get nice apical contrast following this 0.5 milliliter injection here of uh, Lumison, uh, but the bases are obscured. You're not really clearly seeing uh, the entire uh, 17 segments you would like to see. And that's where the very low mechanical index harmonic imaging approach provides an astounding improvement in the quality of the image. Uh, this approach is fairly straightforward, okay? It's been around uh, since the turn of the century. Okay, uh, which is uh, say, uh, sounds like a long time ago, but it was around 2000 uh, that these concepts came out uh, that when we transmit a very low mechanical index a signal into tissue, we get harmonic responses. And this forms the basis of harmonic imaging and that we see uh, some harmonic signals uh, with minimal tissue signal. Because our biggest concern has always been, well, the tissue will produce a lot of signal at the fundamental frequency. Well, that's really only true if you're transmitting at a mechanical index of 0.5 or higher. If you turn the mechanical index down to less than 0.2 and, uh, and look at the uh, nonlinear fundamental signals, uh, as well as the linear fundamental signals, you'll see that there's a lot of linear, uh, uh, excuse me, nonlinear fundamental activity going on, uh, whereas very little fundamental linear activity is occurring. Uh, and this allows us at a very low mechanical index uh, imaging technique to take advantage of this much greater energy produced in the fundamental frequency from the microbubbles uh, when compared to harmonic frequencies. This concept, if we use a less than 0.2 mechanical index, not only reduces the signal from tissue, but enhances the signal from the microbubbles and allows us to uh, image at a frequency there there is minimal attenuation with, which would be, uh, for, for example, 1.8 uh, megahertz as opposed to 3.6. Well, that was a bunch of uh, a technical language. Here's what it looks like when you push the button, 
the low mechanical index imaging, very low mechanical index imaging button uh, and go to a 1.8 megahertz transmit and 1.8 megahertz receive frequency, looking now just at fundamental nonlinear activity. In this same patient where we had no window <laughs> without contrast, a partial window with low MI harmonic imaging, we now can see all the segments very well uh, with very low mechanical index imaging or fundamental nonlinear imaging. And this plays out day, out day in and day out in our lab uh, with almost all the stress echocardiograms, but uh, up to 50% uh, of the uh, transthoracic regular echocardiograms that we're performing at bedside or uh, as outpatient. And that's because we get a lot of windows like this where they're very poor quality. Uh, and we then switch to this fundamental nonlinear imaging technique or very low mechanical index imaging. And we take windows that would uh, be impossible to interpret and require some additional imaging technique and transform them with very low mechanical index imaging at a 0.18 megahertz, uh, or excuse me, mechanical index and a 1.8 megahertz frequency into a, a very interpretable study uh, where not only uh, do we see regional wall motion very well, but we can quantify ejection fraction uh, and use the contrast to its optimal uh, uh, potential uh, for left ventricular opacification, that FDA-approved indication. So the guidelines committee emphasized that one should use the very low mechanical index multipulse sequence uh, uh, in situations uh, where you cannot get an adequate window uh, because it reduces microbubble destruction because we're using a very low mechanical index. It decreases attenuation from basal segments because we're using a now fundamental frequency at 1.8 megahertz uh, or less than 2 megahertz. Uh, and because it captures that much uh, higher energy fundamental nonlinear signal, it enhances the contrast that we get when compared to low MI harmonic imaging. So it is optimal for both wall motion and perfusion imaging. When should this be used? Well, the guidelines committee felt that this was necessary as in 2008 with the original guidelines that we should use it whenever two contiguous segments cannot be visualized, but also in clinical situations where uh, you need to see all the coronary artery territories very well. And this is played out, for example, in this patient we just had in the emergency room, okay? Uh, came in with chest pain, a negative troponin on the initial troponin check, had some history of a recent amphetamine use, was still having some chest pain, EKG was non-diagnostic, uh, and uh, this was the uh, uh, initial unenhanced images, which were not so bad, not like our previous patients where it was obvious that we needed contrast. So you would say, well, can I get by without contrast here? Uh, looks pretty good. Wall motion was interpreted as uh, relatively normal, but again, when we apply the guidelines, we didn't feel we could see this coronary artery territory, this anterior segment, very well. So, when we administered, uh, in this case, an infusion of the ultrasound enhancing agent and used the very low mechanical index imaging technique, look right here. The mid anterior, this is four chamber now, here's the four chamber without the agent. With the agent, now we see a mid anterior lateral, distal lateral, and apical perfusion defect. This was also seen, and, and wall motion ob abnormality, obviously, as well. This is a two-shaped view. This is why we utilized the uh, uh, contrast, because we couldn't see this coronary artery territory real well. When we gave the enhancing agent with very low mechanical index imaging, we could see that this anterior and distal, mid-anterior, distal anterior segments were hypokinetic, severely hypokinetic. This patient had a 99% first uh, large first diagonal lesion at subsequent angiography. But you see how the very low mechanical index imaging technique allows us to optimize left ventricular opacification and detect these regional wall motion abnormalities. Here you can see how this works in a basal segment where uh, there was a question following PCI of the right coronary artery. What's going on with wall thickening here? Again, this is a tough territory for all of us, that basal inferior segment. Again, because we transmit at 1.8 megahertz, and receive at 1.8 megahertz, we can see this basal segment much better when we infuse an ultrasound enhancing agent with very low uh, MI imaging. And this was a 2,000 patient study where we randomized patients 
to uh, either uh, uh, the low MI uh, harmonic imaging approach for contrast when it was necessary, or utilize the very low mechanical index imaging, which at that time was referred to as real-time myocardial contrast echo, or RT-MCE. A resting uh, wall thickening abnormality detected with this very low mechanical index imaging technique was the single most important predictor of outcome, even in patients referred for stress echo. Uh, this was not true if we were using contrast with low mechanical index imaging or harmonic imaging only or not using contrast at all. Then a resting wall motion abnormality was not nearly as predictive. This is because the very low mechanical index imaging, just as you saw in my previous patient, uh, helps us detect regional wall motion abnormalities with much more uh, better sensitivity. And therefore, the guidelines have emphasized uh, as a level one, uh, consensus of recommendation one, that you should use the enhancing agent whenever adequate segmental visualization of any coronary territory cannot be achieved. Uh, and that very low mechanical index imaging is the preferred imaging mode uh, and should be used uh, if you want with uh, intermittent high mechanical index impulses to clear the myocardium. But as you saw in the examples I showed you, just using the very low mechanical index imaging approach alone, you can detect these regional wall motion abnormalities quite well using either a continuous infusion or the small bolus injections as pointed out here uh, of Definity, uh, Lumison, or Optison. Now, I'm going to have Margaret uh, Park here in just a moment. She's going to go over these applications with you uh, uh, where uh, uh, left ventricular pacification uh, and volume measurements are critical. What I want to do in just the last couple of minutes of my uh, uh, portion of the, of the uh, webinar is discuss this myocardial perfusion concept, which is also uh, added to regional wall motion uh, in improving the sensitivity of detecting coronary artery disease. And what this technique, as is displayed here, does is look at end systolic replenishment of a myocardial contrast following brief high mechanical index impulses, typically around 1.0 mechanical index, uh, and analyzes those rate of replenishment within the myocardium uh, and the plateau intensity. Uh, this rate of replenishment allows us to detect uh, perfusion abnormalities if it takes longer than four seconds under resting conditions or two seconds under stress conditions for this replenishment to occur after a brief high mechanical index impulse, that is considered abnormal. And what does this do? Does it add to our regional wall motion anal uh, uh, analysis? Well, uh, it seems that it does add to that uh, in certain situations one of which is during stress echocardiography. This is dobutamine stress echocardiography, looking at an apical three-chamber view, where you're looking uh, on the real-time images there of how rapidly the replenishment occurred following a, about two seconds after a high mechanical index impulse under resting conditions, side-by-side, -side, digitally displayed, uh, with the re replenishment in the, uh, uh, during stress. And you can see during stress, there, this inferolateral segment uh, is not replenishing, even though the wall thickening is quite normal. Uh, and when we look at the end systolic images, which is what is recommended uh, for uh, analysis uh, of, of replenishment, there is a delay. And this patient had a significant left circumflex and right coronary artery stenosis at subsequent angiography. Both uh, vessels were abnormal. Also, we have observed, uh, especially during dobutamine stress, that early in the stage of the test, before the patient reaches their uh, maximum uh, heart rate, we begin to see perfusion abnormalities. Uh, this is a patient that was a transplant, a kidney transplant evaluation patient, no known CAD, just the diabetic patient with kidney failure, and who had this done prior to uh, renal transplant evaluation. And you can see, uh, there was a definite perfusion defect. This is two seconds after that high mechanical index impulse along uh, this segment here. Even though wall thickening was very vigorous, there was no replenishment uh, of myocardial contrast in this myo the anterior myocardial segments here, uh, and the patient was subsequently found to have a totally occluded left anterior descended, descending artery that was uh, being fed by collaterals from the right coronary artery. And this analysis of adding a perfusion and wall motion together 
uh, which is shown here in the blue line here in these 2,000 patients that we followed prospectively that were randomized to either uh, very low mechanical index imaging with perfusion and wall motion analysis versus the conventional approach of, of contrast being used only for LVO with low MI harmonic imaging. You can see in an abnormal study was much more predictive of subsequent cardiac events than was an abnormal study with just conventional stress echo. That's because of the improved regional wall motion analysis and uh, the improved uh, perfusion. So the guidelines committee felt that if you're performing myocardial perfusion imaging, although it is off-label, uh, there's a lot of good data supporting its use. Uh, it should be used uh, with this flash replenishment technique. Now, going back just to those resting images I talked about, uh, this technique has been used in the emergency room, just like I showed you in that example earlier, uh, to identify patients who are at high risk. And I showed this uh, study from uh, Kevin Way and the group at Oregon Health Sciences that looked at over a thousand patients, literally 2,000 patients, uh, uh, in uh, examining what additional data we get from analyzing regional function and perfusion uh, in this setting. And when we add uh, myocardial perfusion and regional function, or RF here, you can see that if these tests are abnormal, uh, when added to just an EKG score um, uh, uh, as well as a clinical score, you can see that the regional function and myocardial perfusion, if both are abnormal, this is the highest risk patient uh, for predicting uh, adverse outcomes, in this case, death or non-fatal myocardial infarction. And looking at this microvascular perfusion will be the, the wave of the future for two reasons. One, because we can look at this microvascular replenishment, there are times where after patients have a, a, a very successful percutaneous coronary intervention and acute myocardial infarction, where we see persistent microvascular defects despite what they're telling us there's an open left circumflex in this particular case in this patient. Well, we said it may be an open epicardial vessel, but the microvasculature, which you can see here, that's that plateau intensity, was clearly abnormal still. So we can detect these microvascular abnormalities in other settings uh, where there isn't any further epicardial disease. And what are the implications of that? Well, obviously, it helps us identify patients at high risk for adverse outcomes, as this has been shown to do. But it adds our uh, additional data that we don't get with stress specs, okay? Um, uh, it allows us to look at uh, additional uh, evaluations. We can look at the microvasculature of a mass, for example. Uh, uh, we can also look at the, uh, the skeletal muscle, as Jonathan Linner is doing in some peripheral vascular uh, disease patients. We can apply this in pediatrics to look at the microvasculature in patients that have had congenital defects that have been corrected and now may have right ventricular perfusion abnormalities. And lastly, we can use this technique uh, to look uh, at the potential of high mechanical index impulses, which disrupt the microbubbles and cause them to cavitate, uh, we can look at that potential, that cavitation phenomena, to restore microvascular flow. This is work uh, from a 100-patient study that has been completed now uh, in Brazil, uh, looking at patients with ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, where if we repeatedly apply those high mechanical index impulses, that were helpful in detecting microvascular perfusion, as I showed you previously, we could not only uh, uh, detect that, but repeatedly applying them to the microvasculature improved microvascular flow in this setting. So there are ongoing trials now in our country, in the United States, that are looking at adding this to primary uh, percutaneous coronary interventions to improve microvascular flow and prevent scar formation in acute myocardial infarction. So I'm going to conclude here uh, just to emphasize that very low mechanical index imaging uh, is the new standard for contrast enhanced imaging because it allows us to get to that point where we can truly uh, uh, um, uh, uh, see the, the improvement we can uh, obtain with uh, ultrasound enhancing agents for the FDA approved indication of LVO. It also allows us to do microvascular perfusion imaging, but several potential applications uh, uh, that will be uh, show, uh, demonstrated in subsequent clinical trials and allows us to take these vascular applica uh, cardio cardiac applications to the vasculature, to the vasodasorum, uh, and to targeted therapy. 
And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Margaret Park, uh, who now is going to dig deeper uh, into how we can utilize uh, these agents uh, in, in optimizing our day in and day out studies of, of, uh, of several applications uh, where LVO is critical. Margaret, take over. Thank you very much, Tom. That was really a great uh, introduction for what I have to follow with. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about how we can use all of these new features that we now have available to us with our contrast ultrasound enhancing agents and optimize our images uh, to a much better degree and do a much better job than we've been doing in the past. So uh, these are just my disclosures. Um, as Tom had mentioned, about 30% uh, of studies uh, that we do routinely in our lab every day are technically difficult, and for a variety of different reasons. And uh, unfortunately, most of the patients that really need us to get the most clear images as possible, those in the intensive care units and the emergency room, uh, are our most technically difficult patients to do because of you know small rooms and tight spaces. Um, they have bad patient positioning, and we have very poor window access due to other reasons. So of those 30% of patients that we find technically difficult, we still are not achieving our goal of 100% of those patients receiving a contrast-enhancing agent. And on top of that, those patients that are receiving it, we're not achieving our goal of optimizing our images into the best way possible. So I hope that uh, this lecture today will encourage you to uh, take your non-diagnostic images and use all of the tools that we have available to us, including the very low MI imaging, and be able to uh, put forth a study that gives not only um, ourselves uh, diagnostic confidence, but diagnostic confidence to our physicians so that we can take the best care of our patients. So we're gonna keep that as our number one goal throughout this uh, lecture. As Dr. Porter already pointed out, uh, I'd like to thank the entire committee and Dr. Porter, who was chair, uh, in the development of these uh, new ASE guidelines. And we are now um, calling very low MI imaging the new standard uh, for contrast and enha uh, enhancing agent imaging. And it's very important that you speak with your um, manufacturers and your application specialists when they come in to see if this is available currently on your system and if it is not how it can become available and how you can get the right training to be able to use this uh, to its full extent and knowledge. So some of the advantages that have already been touched upon in using VLMI over low MI imaging is that it enhances contrast compared to low MI, the low MI setting. Uh, it definitely helps us out with preventing swirling and gives us a much better uh, delineation of the apical area. It naturally reduces attenuation, uh, especially from the basal wall segment. It reduces microbubble destruction uh, compared to low MI imaging, so we don't have to worry quite as much about optimizing uh, everything. And it is optimal, as Dr. Porter pointed out, for perfusion imaging, imaging and wall motion abnormality identifications. So we'll just talk a little bit about our contrast package setting choices that we have available for us. If you have the very low MI imaging available, you will have set that, already have set that up with your manufacturer or your application specialist and know how to use it. It's important to know that just because you can turn your MI down to below 0.2, does not mean that you have VLMI on your system. Remember that uh, VLMI imaging is using nonlinear activity, whereas your low MI is using a harmonic imaging. So make sure that you contact your application specialist and learn how to use all these new tools that we have available to us. In the uh, ASE guidelines, there uh, you'll be able to find this this graph available to you, this chart, and it does talk about the different manufacturers and where the location of the um, LVO and LVMI software is on your system. It also tells you where the flash button is located and uh, what, what transducer frequencies you need to use to be able to use these. 
This is just an example. On some of the systems, you may have to go through two or three different levels before you are able to get to the very low MI imaging uh, software. So keep that in mind when you're looking for your flash button. It can be anywhere um, on your system console itself, or it might even be on your touch screen. But one thing uh, for sure, whether you, you are using the very low MI imaging or if you're using low MI harmonic imaging, you're going to have to optimize each and every patient that receives a contrast enhancing agent in your laboratory. So it's important to have, uh, I like to have a system of getting my image set up to receive the contrast and then uh, a systematic uh, way of knowing what I need to do next to optimize for that particular patient. So just like when you're imaging in your regular imaging non-contrast mode, you optimize every image per the patient, and the patient's images uh, will also drive what needs to be optimized when you're using both low MI and very low MI imaging. So I'd like to point out some of the key settings that affect bubble destruction when you're imaging with a contrast enhancing agent. Uh, the mechanical index, of course, as we all know, is very important. The frequency of your transducer can also affect your mechanical index. Frame rate, which can be uh, uh, changed whenever you change your depth or your sector size. And then where you place your focal zone all have uh, the capability of destroying your bubbles faster than you want them to when you're imaging with a contrast enhancing agent. So we all need to learn how to optimize our controls before we actually even receive contrast. You will want to make sure that when you go into your contrast package setting that the gains are low and you want to adjust your TGC curves. I like to start with them all sort of in the center all the way from the near field to the far field. You'll have to optimize your transmit focus. Most of us will start with the transmit focus at the mitral valve level and be aware that you can change that focal position at any point throughout while you're imaging. You want to minimize your depth initially and narrow your sector to focus on the area of interest. Also, it's very important to know where those values are on your screen when you're imaging so you can take a look very quickly at what it what is set at and if, decide whether or not you need to change that first. So be aware of where frame rate is being displayed, where your overall gains are being displayed, and if you are using the very low MI imaging or the low harmonic imaging on most systems now, you will be able to see what your imaging uh, mechanical index is set at and what your flash mechanical index is set at. And it is important to have your flash mechanical index uh, greater than 0.7 or 0.8 uh, for it to be effective to clear out uh, the myocardium. Also note where your focus is being placed when you open up your package. So another very invaluable uh, document that is located in the, uh, uh, the JACE 2014 issue of optimizing um, with contrast, this just sort of gives you uh, something to keep around to help you with your troubleshooting. It'll tell you what to do if you uh, are seeing swirling or if you have very little contrast coming into your image, uh, whether or not you have side lobe artifact and so forth. So keep this in a, an area in the lab that's easy to find and make sure that you're referring back to this when you're having issues, especially if you're new on uh, dealing with contrast. So one of the things um, that we sometimes have trouble with is swirling and attenuation. And I want to just point out again that if you're using the very low MI settings, this is um, very good at minimizing the swirling and the attenuation effects that we have with low MI imaging. So if you are experiencing swirling, as we see in the images here, the first thing you would want to do is look at your MI setting. You want to reduce your myocardial uh, index so that you're destroying less bubbles. Check your frame rate. Make sure your frame rates aren't too high. Now, if you have a very weak left ventricular function and a large ventricle, you may have to inject a slightly larger contrast dose, so check the volume of the dose that you're injecting. It also may help to move your focus uh, transiently to the near and far field. So you want to move it from the far field to the near field. And again, it's important to communicate uh, with whoever is helping, assisting you in this and doing the injecting 
so that you can optimize the flow rate at which they're injecting. If they inject too fast, you're going to end up with attenuation. If you have a weak contrast signal, sometimes it's because the agent uh, was not properly activated, or it could be that the uh, agent has started to separate and you may have to uh, agitate that syringe a little bit and reactivate your product. You want to check your IV line and make sure your IV line is open, that there's no blockage. Uh, you can do that by flushing with some saline. Check your machine settings. Make sure that you are in the contrast preset, that your MI is not too high. Again, check the patient's arm to make sure it's clear. And sometimes it'll help to raise the arm and actually massage the arm. It sort of helps the contrast uh, get back up into the vessel a little bit faster. So sometimes uh, we can use attenuation to our benefit. So if we have a very large baggy LV that has um, very low ejection fraction and we're having trouble getting our contrast to go all the way up to the apex, we can actually inject faster, uh, a slightly larger bolus, and get the attenuation to highlight and light up the apex for us so that we can actually see very clearly the delineation at the apex and that structure much more clearly. Now, if you're using very low MI imaging, uh, you may need to increase your <coughs> near field uh, TGCs to help light up that apex a little bit more. So sometimes you want to create that attenuation effect as we did in the previous slides. Other times, uh, you're going to have attenuation because of error. Either uh, you injected too fast or you injected too large of a bolus. So there are a few things you can do to uh, reduce the attenuation. You can simply wait for the contrast uh, to dilute and the attenuation to clear. But if you're in a hurry, uh, you can transiently increase the MI to induce some degree of uh, microbubble destruction. Uh, and the other thing you can do is you can actually turn on your flash and destroy some of those uh, bubbles to be able to uh, relieve this situation with the attenuation. So to avoid the problem, you want to use a slower rate and a smaller amount of contrast bolus uh, for subsequent cycles. So our time gain compensation curves really help us optimize uh, areas at the apex and at the base. With VLMI imaging, it's often necessary to increase the TGCs not only uh, in the far field but also in the near field. And as you can see on the first image on the left, uh, we're able to see very clearly uh, the upper two-thirds of the ventricle, but we're really missing this third basal section. So by just increasing the TGCs, TGC curve uh, in the far field, we're now able to very clearly see what's going on not only at the base of the septum, but what's going on at the base and mid portions of the lateral wall. So there was no change here in the MI. There was simply a change uh, in increasing our TGC curves into the far field. Again, on the same patient in the short axis, uh, having the same effect, we were sort of losing the half of the ventricle in short axis. And here, uh, by increasing our TGC curves, we've got a much nicer delineation of our LVO. So what about rib attenuation? Sometimes we get this uh, shadowing, as Dr. Porter talked about earlier, in the area of the lateral wall where we're not really able to identify any thickening uh, of the endocardium, and we have dropout in this area. Majority of the time uh, in low MI, low MI imaging, you'll actually need to pick up your probe and move to another window to sort of avoid that artifact. And this should be less prominent at the basal area with BLMI imaging. Another thing that you can do if you're really, really having, a, having trouble in picking this up is you can actually angle your probe and sort of foreshorten your ventricle just to pull in the basal portions. Uh, of your ventricle here so that you're able to see these much more clearly and reduce that rib artifact. So I wanted to talk today a little bit about volume assessment and using our contrast and enhancing agents to measure volumes. One thing that's important to remember is that most of the uh, reports that we find that tell us what is normal, mild, moderate, or severe for LV volume 
has been calculated on non-contrast uh, enhancing images. So you may find that your, uh, your contrast enhanced images volumes are larger and outside of the range of some normal mild or mild to moderate uh, volume enlargements. Be careful in comparing those. It's best to compare them to uh, cardiac MR volumes because they do uh, apply closer to cardiac MRI volumes than they do non-contrast imaging volumes. So uh, finally, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about Doppler enhancement and how we can use contrast enhancing agents to help us with our Doppler. A lot of times you'll have a very, very difficult aortic stenosis patient uh, that you're having a really hard time getting a clear, a clear flow. Make sure you're using your volume on your Doppler. That's number one. You have to hear whether or not you're actually in that jet. But if you're not able to get a clear jet for either your tricuspid regurgitation volume, your pulmonary veins, you know, even with uh, stenosis, you can rely on your contrast to help enhance those agents. Now, you have to be careful that you turn your gains down, your Doppler gains down to about um, below 20% so that you're not overgaining. And you do have to wait a little bit for some of the contrast to wash out to get a nice clear signal. But as an example here with our tricuspid regurgitation, we were able to get a very nice clear window throughout all of systole by enhancing with our contrast. And same thing with aortic stenosis, we were able to see a very clear definitive peak from baseline uh, to post with contrast by using contrast to enhance our Doppler. So it's a little bit tricky and it does take some experience and some time, but waiting a little bit for washout uh, perhaps turn your MI a little, up a little bit to reduce some of the bubble noise and artifact, and then make sure your gain is down to about 20% or lower, and you'll be able to get some very nice Doppler enhancement uh, on your patients. So in conclusion today, I wanted to stress the fact that uh, it's important to use the very uh, low MI imaging. It's now our preferred method of contrast enhancement agent method of delivery. So please talk to your application specialist, your manufacturers, find out if it's on your machine. If it is, have them teach you how to set things up and how to use it and get going with it. Make sure you optimize during your pre and post, con post contrast imaging. It's in, uh, important to enhance your Doppler as well. Make sure you're comp complementing your apical views with parasternal long and parasternal short axis uh, in the contrast mode. Use perfusion to improve your wall motion assessment, and if available, use flash to clear the microbubbles, which will allow visual, uh, better visualization of your wall motion abnormalities and contrast uh, repl replenishment into the myocardium. I want to thank, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak to you today and also thank the um, IAC and Dr. Porter for having me join him. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Coco. And at this time, we will begin the Q&A session. Um, again, we encourage you to submit your questions using the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. And from IAC ECHO, I'd like to introduce our clinical specialists, Sandy DePetris and Ann Groves. Sandy and Ann will be assisting with the Q&A session today. Sandy, would you like to start us off? Sure, Kelly. Thanks. Um, Josephine asks, 2D volume, 2D apical volume compares to MR volume, or 2D with contrast compares to MR volume? That's the question. Yeah, it's a very good question. And as uh, uh, Coco just pointed out, the, uh, the, the, the data is clearly different. The, the, num the volumes are larger uh, when using contrast-enhanced uh, uh, imaging. And this has been in multi-center studies actually looked at, uh, and the correlation with biplane contrast enhanced left ventricular volumes and, uh, was much closer with MRI uh, than unenhanced echo. So the contrast enhanced uh, volumes that we get uh, from a very low mechanical index imaging uh, correlate very closely with MRI volumes and ejection fractions. Uh, and so I, we think that's probably, again, just because we're delineating better that uh, endocardial, that compacted border of myocardium, which is what is also used for MRI. Okay. Um, another question is, is the bolus form of UEAs diluted in the saline? Uh, I, I, I guess what I understand, and I, I'll have Margaret uh, answer some of this too, we, we, 
if you're going to give a bolus with the recommendations from the guidance was that you give the undiluted agent in very small quantities, like uh, less than uh, about 0.1 of Definity or uh, 0.5 of Lumison or uh, Optison, 0.3 to 0.5 of Lumison or Optison, uh, and then follow that with a slow 5 to 10 uh, saline flush. So it would be undiluted in that uh context. Uh, if uh, you give it as an infusion, that's different. Then, yes, you would uh, dilute it. Uh, we typically dilute half a vial of, uh, for example, in the case of Definity, half a vial of Definity in 30 milliliters of saline and infuse that around four uh, to five mils per minute. Uh, Margaret, uh, is that uh, what you would do with that or what, what are you primarily doing? Well, I think uh, it varies across the country, but we currently are diluting our um, Definity. Uh, with seven milliliters of saline, and we use it as a diluted uh, bolus. Okay. Okay, here's another question. For perfusion with VLMI settings on specific equipment, um, this person says that their hospital uses a bolus administration of Definity and then um, a slow infusion diluted uh, saline infusion with Definity over three minutes to obtain the LV and perfusion images during that period. Is, does that seem appropriate or because it sounds like you're just saying bolus? I, I would, in, in terms of perfusion imaging, it, it is very important to have kind of a steady state concentration of the uh, micro bubbles uh, when applying that high mechanical index impulse and then analyzing replenishment. And that can be achieved with a very uh, small bolus injection and a slow saline flush. And there's clearly a period of time there uh, where there's kind of a plateau intensity. Uh, it's obviously the easiest to do with an infusion. Uh, so I think the technique that was described there, a, a small bolus uh, and then an infusion uh, should work uh, pretty well uh, in most circumstances, uh, regardless of the agent uh, you're using. Uh, the key is, like I said, something that gives you a steady, relatively steady period of, homo of uh, homogenous uh, enhancement uh, that allows you to apply that high mechanical index impulse uh, and analyze the replenishment. So di diluting, giving a small bolus and then giving a, a dilute infusion uh, should work quite well. Okay, Susan is asking, who administers the contrast in your lab? Yes. So well, again, uh, this is, uh, I'll turn this over to uh, Coco uh, to uh, give their opinion. Right in our particular uh, state, we uh, are only uh, nurses are administering the enhancing agent uh, because uh, uh, at least what we're told at this time, it's not been uh, allowable for the sonographers to do that. Um, there seems to be a lot of uh, misinformation maybe on this um, in that uh, it it seems to be within the scope of work of our sonographers, but uh, for some reason, the MRI techs and, and CT techs can be down there giving um, bolus injections of, of contrast uh, with power injectors, and no one seems to care yet. The, the sonographers cannot be allowed to give an IV one milliliter injection of contrast, <laughs> which seems very strange. But in our hospital, it's just nurses. Uh, Margaret, uh, what is your uh, policy in Ohio there? Yeah, so uh, we have uh, our policy here at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we have a really, we have a very smooth use of contrast. We use a lot of contrast in the lab. We have nurses that are devoted to the echo lab that are in the echo lab 24-7 with us. Uh, and things work out quite well for us. Uh, in other institutions uh, nearby in Ohio, uh, they, we do have sonographers that are not only uh, preparing IVs, starting IVs themselves, but they're also injecting contrast. The state of Indiana uh, has been doing that for years. So I think it just varies uh, by lab and institution as to what works best in your particular institution and what the rules of your particular institution are. Um, it is not necessarily always a state rule because we have many, as Dr. Porter pointed out, there are many uh, areas in the hospital where non-licensed individuals, such as MR uh, technologists and CT technologists, they are just certified technologists, not licensed, and they are injecting things that are much more harm can be much more harmful than our contrast uh, enhancing agents. So it really varies on the institutional policy. 
but it is in the scope of practice uh, written by several uh, large organizations such as the Society of Diagnostic Medical Sonography, and they all meet with AIUM and ASC and, you know, the imaging societies when they write these, they are approved by everyone. Um, it is in the scope of the practice for the sonographer to uh, start IV access and to inject contrast. Again, it what works best in your lab uh, to make it a most efficient process and time-saving process. So I think that's the important key is to get it to work well and to work right so that we can do, we can use contrast on that 30% of patients well. Okay, Gary asks, uh, are there any black box warnings remaining uh, for contrast agents? And if so, what are the practical effects on the workflow? Well, that's a very good question. And uh, the, as you uh, may be aware, uh, all, pretty much all of the uh, uh, box, uh, box, box, black box warnings are removed. Uh, there is no contraindication in pulmonary hypertension or unstable coronary syndromes or uh, in patients that um, have right to left shunts. Uh, the only thing that is uh, of concern is that you need to be aware that there's a very rare but uh, potential anaphylactoid reaction that can occur. Um, and typically our nurses in our lab uh, all have EpiPens um, available should that happen. And we've seen it maybe uh, in about one in 10,000 uh, injections or infusions. Uh, and so that's the one remaining concern uh, that uh, you should be aware of. Other than that, um, pretty much everything else that was a consideration uh, has been removed. Now, that being said, be aware of the fact that Optosan uh, is a blood, uh, has albumin products. So it, that would be something to always uh, be, make sure your patient is aware of that. Uh, and uh, they all have the potential for uh, allergy, allergy to perfutrin or allergy to sulfur hexafluoride. These are extremely rare. Uh, but the main concerns that uh, were originally in the box warning have been removed. Okay. All right, Juan wants to know, does contrast enhancing provide more accurate strain or should they refuse from using strain after a contrast injection? Well, yes, again, a, a very good question. And I think the best thing, obviously it has, the strain has been not been optimized for contrast, but I think there's real potential there because you can see in some of the examples that uh, uh, both uh, Coco and I showed you, you cannot see the endocardial border <laughs> in a lot of these patients. And, you know, you really need to see that to really know uh, what endocardial strain is doing. Uh, so this is an area that really does need uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, research and uh, input from the manufacturers and from investigators, because certainly I think there are methods uh, by which a strain can be utilized with contrast. Uh, and uh, should be utilized um, in order to really make strain the, the effective tool it has the uh, potential to be. Uh, it really shouldn't be a tool that we can just use in people with really good windows. We need to know how to use, uh, utilize it when the windows are not good, uh, and there are methods by which um, that can be done, uh, and I think uh, the best way perhaps to do that is use that high mechanical index impulse and look at those first images uh, where the myocardium is cleared of contrast for an analysis of strain. But uh, uh, Coco, are you uh, using um, strain with contrast? Um, it is difficult at best on um, washout sometimes. Um, you can get a better strain evaluation because there's just a little bit of contrast less in, left in the myocardium, but it does cause a lot of uh, interference. And I think the pixels are difficult to follow when we've got contrast and, you know, in the mix with it. So at this point, it is difficult to do, and it's it's best to do the contrast either at baseline, bef I mean, to do the strain at baseline before you've done the contrast enhancing, or do it later on when you've got pretty good washout, um, and you're still in your mind knowing where the, the border is, because it is difficult to see it, and it's like 3D, if you have a very difficult patient, you're not going to get a good 3D image either. It's the same thing with strain. And like you said, I think it has a lot of potential and work moving forward if we could get it to work with contrast. 
speaking of image quality, Pam wants to know, does VLMI work well on all patient body types, for example, obese or patients with COPD or a specific type of patient? Again, a very good question. I, again, that the, the patients you specifically pointed out, uh, out of where uh, we have seen the very low uh, MI imaging work the best. If you have a very good window, then a, a harmonic mode uh, will probably still work pretty well uh, for uh, detecting uh, uh, the basal segments. But if you have an obese patient or a patient on a ventilator, like that example I showed you, uh, or a patient that was COPD where there's a lot of uh, difficulty obtaining a good window, this is where very low mechanical index imaging works the, the best because in that setting, you really need something that's a fundamental uh, frequency so you can penetrate uh, and not attenuate and allow you to see all the segments you need to see, uh, which is uh, very difficult uh, in our patient population. We're asked to image these days. So we're aware of the marked increase in obesity uh, and marked uh, increase in patients that are post-operative um, and all these interventional procedures where Clearly, some analysis of ejection fraction and regional wall motion is critical. It is in these situations where very low mechanical index imaging really saves the day. You know, I, I get this every day. As soon as we get off the line here, I've got to have to go read multiple echoes. And I'll guarantee you uh, the obese patients and the COPD patients will be the ones that were, were able to provide the definitive type of answer that we could not do uh, with low MI harmonic imaging. Okay, Douglas wants to know um, why you would use attenuation to clarify the APAC, sorry, and under what circumstances would this be used and why? I'll, I'll let Margaret answer that when she showed that example there, that uh, particular case where they used uh, attenuation to better visualize the apex. You want to explain that again, Margaret? Absolutely. Uh, so using VLMI should help alleviate this problem. But if you are using uh, low MI imaging, that's what is available to you, and you have a very large LV, very large volume LV with a very low ejection fraction, it can be difficult to prevent swirling, and it can be difficult to get all of the uh, contrast enhancing agent up towards the apex because of the low circulation of the volume of blood at the apex. So if you inject at a faster a faster rate and perhaps a slightly larger bolus, the attenuation will help push the contrast up towards the apex so they're able to better identify what's going on at the apex, whether or not there's poor wall motion, you know, is there a thrombus in the area, et cetera. So it can be uh, sometimes used to your benefit. The majority of the time it's a hassle, but uh, it can be used to your benefit to help delineate the borders at the apex. Okay, and Teresa asks, can the performing sonographer administer the contrast and still obtain the images, or is it best to have uh, a tag team, basically? A very good question, and I, I, I realize that in some situations uh, in small hospitals or where you're uh, all you know, pretty much on your own, uh, I know Kevin Way had developed a technique a while ago where he would just basically – uh, when he was imaging alone, uh, inject a little contrast into an IV bag and allow that to infuse while he was doing imaging. And, and although that's, you know, if you're, uh, that may be one option you have to use, but these agents do require a little bit of uh, continuous suspension. Uh, as uh, Margaret pointed out, they, they tend to, you know, uh, condense or, or uh, accumulate along walls if they're not constantly mixed. It really does work best if you have a second person uh, infusing or injecting and another person imaging, though it's, it's possible. I, that doesn't, I don't want to uh, exclude the people that have to kind of image a lot on their own. Uh, it's possible to do it uh, with a, a, a nurse. Certainly a, a nurse can help out uh, and, um, and, and improve the quality of the images because our nurses pick up right away when they're not getting good contrast. They know how to uh, keep that uh, infusion or a uh, small bolus working best or when to readminister a bolus. The sonographers, you know, don't even really have to answer or tell them to give another small bolus. So you can certainly tag team with other people in the hospital to help you. Um, and I think it works best as a tag team. What do you think, uh, Coco? Uh, I have to agree, Tom. I've 
always had the opportunity to work with uh, other sonographers and nursing staff when we're using uh, the agents here. Uh, however, I have been to other labs across the country where uh, the sonographers uh, are able to inject and scan at the same time. Definitely not easy to do and certainly more difficult to, to do correctly and to do clearly. So I would recommend uh, a tag team of, you know, whether it be another nurse or another sonographer assisting. But if you are in a situation where you have to do it yourself, I think, you know, you can probably be successful, but I think it would be difficult. Okay. For the last question, Amit wants to know, can you use contrast with TEE? And if so, what are the techniques that you would use to optimize it? Well, these have been some outstanding questions. Um, yes, uh, the guidelines committee felt uh, uh, based on studies uh, that uh, had been done, especially looking at the left atrial appendage, uh, to rule in or rule out a thrombus that uh, enhancing agents definitely had a role uh, during um, transesophageal echocardiography in that specific application. Uh, they haven't been investigated for other uh, specific applications like improving LVO, um, but I think uh, a lot of that stems from the fact that we really don't have optimal imaging techniques yet on the TE probes for detecting and enhancing the contrast. It certainly would be Recommend at this point to use, if you have available to you, a harmonic uh, uh, sequence, um, which probably most of them have on there now. Uh, but even with that, you're still not getting uh, really good contrast. It is helpful, though, for looking for a left atrial appendage uh, uh, thrombus and kind of differentiating uh, intense smoke uh, from a, a true thrombus and that the contrast can uh, really nicely fill out that uh, appendage. Uh, it's just that perhaps uh, some improvements, uh, and this is another case where industry really needs to come alongside here and get involved and give us maybe some fundamental nonlinear approaches to looking at uh, contrast during TEE so that we can use it for many applications. Uh, what say you there, Coco? Uh, we are using it uh, in our institution uh, basically just to look for uh, thrombus within the left atrial appendage. Thanks again, everyone. Um, great questions today. And a very special thank you to our guest presenters for sharing their insights with us today. Please feel free to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of this live session and also be available from the IAC webinars portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Clinical Applications of Ultrasonic Enhancing Agents in Echocardiography. Beneath this title, you will see the button Attend Event. Click this button, then the Evaluation tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through the CE transcript section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.